Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. My name is Celeste Brooks. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Warren Coalition. And my job is to introduce Mr. James Carroll today. Uh, the Honorable James W. Jim Carroll was sworn in as the Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, that's ONDCP, on January 31st, 2019, and served through January 2021. He previously served as the Acting Director and Deputy Director of ONDCP from February 2018 to January 2019. His strategic vision for the organization was best summarized in two words, be relentless. Prior to joining ONDCP, Mr. Carroll served as Assistant to the President and Deputy Chief of Staff at the White House. Previously in the administration, Mr. Carroll served as General Counsel of the Office of Management and Budget and as Deputy Assistant and Senior Counsel to the President. His time as Director of ONDCP was his second time serving the American people in support of the President of the United States. During the George W. Bush administration, Mr. Carroll held several, several positions, including Special Assistant and Associate Counsel to the President at the White House, Deputy General Counsel and Acting General Counsel at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and as an attorney of the U.S. Department of Justice. I think that's enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, we, have to, we have to bring it home. <laughs> Mr. Carroll began his career as a state prosecutor in Virginia, earning after as a state sorry uh, after earning his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and his JD from the George Mason University School of Law my husband works at George Mason I could not leave that out <laughs> please welcome Mr. Carroll I think the scariest thing she said there is how much time I spent in the federal government that should really worry you um, <laughs> let, let's be honest um, we have a crisis on our, on our hands right now with so many children dying and I'm not going to mince words. This is not political. I'm just telling you the truth of what's out there. Uh, we're having children dying because the government, the federal government, is not doing enough. And so we're relying on people like the Warren County. Um, we're relying on state, local, um, even tribal law enforcement to try to enforce the laws of our country because right now we are being invaded by fentanyl. And let me be very clear about that. We are being invaded by fentanyl. First off, I think most of you should, would ask, okay, so Jim was the U.S. Drug Czar. That was my informal title. <coughs> what in the world does the U.S. Drug Czar do? Really good question. Um, so I'm the principal, or I was, the principal advisor of the president and to the entire administration on setting U.S. drug policy, as well as overseeing the $35 billion the federal government spends on drug issues. And so that includes prevention, teaching our children the dangers of what's out there, something the law enforcement is doing, God bless them. Talking about getting people into treatment and recovery so that they can have a beautiful life. That's possible, that's something law enforcement also does every day is making sure they understand the rotating nature of the disease of addiction and just cycling people through is not getting them true health. And the last thing that we did, and there are, I have a staff of about 100 professionals at the White House is we ever saw the law enforcement efforts at the federal level to stop the flow of drugs coming into the US. So what does that mean? I oversaw the entire DEA. Um, and making, now I didn't oversee the individual cases, individual matters, but I oversaw their entire budget, oversaw their policy, and make sure their focus was in the right direction. Not only did I love that part of it, the administrator of the DEA at that point, um, he and I became really good friends, and now we work together um, since the administration ended. And why do we work on this issue? So when I was there, I'm going to answer the question, but when I was there, it was the first time in 30 years under President Trump that we had a reduction in the number of Americans dying of a drug overdose. First time in three decades. We got it down to about 70,000. And so we were happy that we got a slight decline and thought we were in the right direction. Last, I guess two years ago, we skyrocketed to 108,000 fatalities. Center for Disease Control issued numbers last week. And when I saw you were having this event, this is like, one, this is my home. Virginia is my home. Um, I've been out in this area a lot. My wife dropped me off so she could go to the Rappahannock Cellars nearby and pick up some wine. Um, <laughs> the, I admit now we're in the monthly wine club at Rappahannock Cellars, and so it's time to come back out here. And so it fit perfectly with the schedule. But last week, um, the new numbers out from the CDC said we're close to 110,000 Americans dying. So what that means is, and I've probably already been talking five minutes, 
which is really too long. But what that means is that someone is dying of an overdose, I'm going to come back to that word, every five minutes in the U.S. Every five minutes, someone's dying. And I said over, I'm going to come back to the word overdose. Some of it is people who have an addiction, they are trying to dose and get their daily fix, or quite frankly, sometimes hourly fix, because you all understand all too well. I'm pointing to our law enforcement, because God bless them, right? Um, they're on the front lines. They understand that the, this is a, not only, we're talking about Texas, Arizona, California um, being border. Warren County is a, is a border community, because the cartels are here. So we talked about overdosing, I'll go back to that. We talked about people who, who are so addicted, they're doing whatever it takes, breaking into houses, breaking into cars, stealing, selling themselves, engaging in criminal behavior um, to feed their addiction. There's a lot of people, these 110,000 Americans that are dying are not overdosing, they're being poisoned. They're being poisoned by the drugs that are in our communities. You've seen the reports, I only have five minutes um, total, or like I said, I probably on six. Um, you can go to Okay, <laughs> that gives me one minute. Um, but what we've seen um, are pills out there that kids are taking because they think there's something else. I am the first to admit I did a lot of stupid stuff when I was a teenager. None of you did, right? <laughs> no? no, 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 okay. Like I said, I'm the only one. Guys, anyone do anything stupid? Nope, um, no one did any. I did a lot of stupid stuff, um, but it wasn't lethal, at least at that point, you know, I, I didn't think I was doing something to take my life. Now what we have to do is educate and tell these kids that's what's out there. Because what's happening is the Chinese are sending chemicals from China to Mexico. These chemicals are then used by the cartels of Mexico to make fentanyl. The money is going back to China, the money is going to Mexico. So how are they making it? They're using pill presses, to put it in the shape of a pill, and the pill presses are so perfect that the manufacturers of the pills can't tell the difference between a real pill and a fake pill by looking at it. Uh, they have to do a chemical analysis to determine whether it's real or legit. So how in God's name are these kids going to be able to tell the difference? That's where the education comes in. In, in terms of the money, let's talk about the the economy is probably a couple trillion dollars in debt because of what's happening on the drug front. But the money right now is going back to China, going back to Mexico. We talked about that. It's not as much cash as there used to be. Used to hear sometimes, um, of, oh, they found a safe house in Mexico or on the um, border of California, and it was filled to the rafters with cash. That's happening less and less because people are using Bitcoin and electronic forms of moving money. How's the money getting back to China? Through Chinese money laundering. The money launderers are just like a fee at the ATM machine, right? It costs you $5 to get out 100 bucks or something like that. That's what the Chinese have been doing, is they pay a fee to be able to launder the money and send it back to China. Now, we're sort of at the verge of the Chinese are able to hold and move so much money, there's no fee for the Chinese to launder the money that goes from the US to Mexico back to China. They are doing it for free because they have so much cash they can make money just off holding it. That's one of the ways that we need to attack them, is going after the money. That hurts them more, sadly, than stopping a, an individual shipment, individual, um, it'll help the community, but it doesn't hurt the cartels when stopping one car. What does is taking away a couple million dollars that is going in that direction, and that's why the role that everyone in this community has, not just law enforcement, not just Warren County, is to be able to do the three things that I found in the Bible study. So I'm in the, this is my last remark, I promise. I'm in a um, Bible study at my church, um, and there's a chapel, my wife and I go to a Bible study every month, and it took me a really long time, right, I'm with the federal government, I am not that smart a guy. So it took me a long time looking at the back of the altar, and there's a phrase, and I realize it applies to what we're doing. It says, first, um, it says, do not be afraid, I am with you. That's our message to people that have an addiction, right? Don't be afraid, we're with you. We're going to get your help, we're going to get you off um, these dangerous drugs. It then says, um, I am here to enlighten. That's the part about educating our children. That's the one enlightening them about the dangers of what's out there. And then the third phrase was, live with a penitent heart. 
repent. These drug traffickers do not repent. It is the most dangerous place in the world to be a minister, Mexico, because if you stand on the altar on Sunday and preach about not dealing drugs, they will kill you. It's the most dangerous place in the world to be a news reporter, because when you write an article that says the cartels are killing people, they then kill the reporter. So that's what we're up against, and that's why this really is true. We're talking about a weapon of mass destruction with 110,000 people dying every year, cartels going after Americans, targeting children, and let's be really clear, they are targeting children. It's the number one cause of death, 18 to 45 year old. And it's the fastest rising cause of death from 12 to 18. So um, this is truly a perfect time. And thank you for allowing me to come. I appreciate you coming. Um, and at the end, if anyone wants to ask questions, I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you all very much. Um, most important thing um, for you guys is go home at the end of your shift. They'll be there another day. We'll go after mm -hmm. them. Um, but God bless you all. Um, Thank the very thin blue line um, that is out there keeping us safe. So, thank you all very much. And we're going to talk about the lock song. We're going to talk and about. And you can pipe in when I get to that part. Okay. Talking with, tell which little me, because that was news to me. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Krista Shiplett. I'm the executive director of the Warren Coalition. Hopefully, you all know what the Warren Coalition is. If you don't, we are a drug prevention, treatment, and recovery agency operating in Warren County. We provide free treatment services to people. Um, and we literally today just opened our recovery house, and we have two people coming into it. So something that we needed, they do have to come in by referral. They cannot come in off the street. These people need to be in some sort of treatment. This is not an Oxford house. They need to be in treatment. They can't just walk in. So please don't go, oh, I know this place you can go. They can't. They've got to have referrals. But we have three coming in today. So I'm going to talk um, about fentanyl and a weapon of mass destruction, and I'll be honest about this title. When I did this, and, and Meredith Bloomfield, who works in our office, who's our Daryl's Hope Coordinator, she does all our drug education in the schools, they asked us to put together this talk, and this, um, this talk is, I cannot give you the slides, we've done this for the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth, and they're hoping it's going to be the curriculum for ninth graders around fentanyl for the state. So no, I cannot give you the slides. I don't really, I made them, but I don't own them. Um, but I can share them. And um, they did not like my title. That, this is not the title the state has, but this is how I truly feel about this. I've done this work for 23 years. I ran a drug prevention coalition in um, Jefferson County, West Virginia for 10 years, and then I came here and I've been at the coalition for 13. When I came to town, it was 2008, I was actually working at Northwestern doing a similar job. Um, I met with people from the drug task force and I said, you know, guys, what are you all busting for? And they said, we're busting for Dilaudid. And I said, you're going to have a heroin issue within two years. And they looked at me like I was crazy. But I had watched it happen in West Virginia. And I had watched us have a pain pill issue. And then I watched it come in and we had a horrible heroin issue. And kids were dying left, right, and center with heroin. It took about two years. And that was two years to the date after we had that conversation, we had our first death from heroin in Warren County. And the needle slid that way. Um, so, Celeste, I'm up here running. I can't run this line trying to talk. I'm not that talented and I don't have a car. <coughs> All right. So, obviously, some of you have a lot more information around this. But this talk is really designed to give to children. And I just gave it at the Champion of Youth Summit um, in Fairfax a couple of weeks ago. Of course, there were no children in that room. But I hope we're going to get something out of this. So, fentanyl is a synthetic substance. There is nothing natural about fentanyl. Now, why is that scary? And you'll see, I'm not gonna read to you from the slides. I'm probably not even gonna pay attention to the slides. I don't teach like that. But it's scary because synthetic medications, anything synthetic, can be juiced up. So we can make it way stronger than something that is occurring in nature and naturally. And I can remember, I think it was 2018, 2017, I had the radio on, it was early in the morning, and they're like, oh, they found a way to synthesize heroin. And I just thought, we're doomed. I mean, that was the thought I had, because we don't care about the poppy fields anymore, and we, we can burn them down, and it doesn't matter, because I can make this in a lab, and I don't need those things anymore. Much easier to get in and out than trying to haul in, you know, bags of um, morphine or whatever they're bringing into the country as precursors, or even the heroin coming in. So this was made originally to treat very severe pain in 1960, and it took eight years to get it cleared through before it actually got out for use on the street. It does exist in patches. Before the fentanyl became mixed in the drugs like they're doing now, people were abusing fentanyl patches that they would get for cancer. They would take the fentanyl out, they would just use that. I did mean to say this, two things, sorry. The first thing I want to say is that um, 
I am due, this is going to sound very strange when I say this, I am due in jail at 1.15 today. I work at RSW. I have to check in at 1.15. Um, so at one o'clock on the nose, my feet have to hit the door. Mr. Carroll can answer anything you need to know, but I, I have to be on time for jail. They have an absolute fit if I'm not there to go through screening at 1.15. So sorry if I run out, but I meant, I meant to say that. Um, and I forgot where I was going, but I did want to say that so you didn't think I was going, oh. So I would have clients in the jail who would talk about misusing fentanyl from patches to begin with that. There were people doing that, next slide. And it's been a while. So I think we have a couple of slides in here about the size of lethal doses. And one of the reasons we chose this slide, this is not ours, I mean obviously you can see this is from Clearview Health, is because this presentation is for kids, and kids know what a sesame seed is. They eat enough burgers and fast food joints that they know what a sesame seed is. And I thought, let's put that up for something that means something to a child to see. Um, I think about kids and I think, well, most kids probably know what sand is, but I meet kids all the time who haven't really even been out of the county and might not have a sense of how big sand is. But I just want you to have some sense of that. Now, carfentanil, that's an animal tray um, that we were seeing lots and lots of overdoses on at a, a while back. I haven't heard as much about it in the news recently, but that's 10,000 times stronger than the morphine. Don't be confused that it, that means stronger than the fentanyl. The fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. Again, morphine, naturally occurring, they get that from the opium as the heroin, but then you start moving into these synthetics coming down. So here's, here's this on, this on what the dose looks like. Next slide, just so you can sort of see another way. Now these are, how much is too much? This is two milligrams, that's what they say is a lethal dose. But I want to be really clear about this. It may not be a lethal dose. Now, I know that sounds like a weird thing because I just said it is a lethal dose. But if you are someone who misuses opiates on a regular basis, you build a tolerance to this drug. So two milligrams might not be something that kills you. You may be able to tolerate that. And I hear, you know, when I'm talking to people in jail, the amount of this substance that they're using, I'm like, it's a, how are you still alive? And quite frankly, a lot of them are still alive because we'll get to it. They've been given naloxone and revived some many, many times. That's how they're still alive. Truthfully, if there weren't naloxone, they would not be alive. So just so you have some sense of what we're talking about. Now, next slide. Um, I want to talk about how opiates work in the body because this is important. And I think for you, if you're parents too, because this can sort of go along on that side, I will tell you one of the telltale signs that I discovered with kiddos. <coughs> so we have opiate receptors throughout our body. And you can see in the diagram that they start in your brain, work all the way down your throat, go into your stomach, go into your intestines, all of that. And they basically trick the body into believing, because your opiate receptors are pain receptors, trick your body into believing you are not experiencing pain. You are still experiencing pain. You are just being fooled by this drug. The pain doesn't go away. You just think the pain is gone. But when you take the opiates for a long period of time, it hypersensitizes those opiate receptors. So if it's missing that drug, the pain that you experience without that drug is far more intense than someone who isn't addicted to the drug. So when those people are coming out of withdrawal and they're screaming in agony, it's because their pain receptors have been even further sensitized so that the pain is that much more excruciating and makes the drug-seeking behavior that much more because they are trying to avoid that pain. The other things that are important about this, and they, they call it dope sick, you all may have seen the book by Beth Macy, Dope Sick, that they're trying to avoid is it puts to sleep your uh, digestive system, basically. And so your intestines don't um, clear the way they should because they're basically taking a nap. So you back up. Now I have had multiple clients who've been in the emergency room because they're vomiting feces. There's, it's not going out, it's gotta come up and they're actually just throwing it up in the emergency room. That is not great. But the second part of that, I don't know if any of you, and people in this room are old enough so this means something. When I talk to kids, like, oh, some of them don't know. But Matthew Perry from Friends, who had a horrible opiate misuse uh, condition, was hospitalized because he actually had blown out his intestine. 
So the feces was leaking into his gut. He was septic. He was in the ICU for months. He had a 2% chance of survival is what they told him. Obviously, he clearly has recovered. But that's another thing that happens. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is it was 2003. I was working in West Virginia, and I got a phone call from Morgan County. It's a couple counties over from a girl who they were doing a, an all-day sort of event around substance misuse and other things for the high school. And they said, hey, will you come out and talk about prescription drug misuse? I was like, what? I had never heard of prescription drug misuse. It wasn't a thing. So I went through, and I'm going through all the government sites. I'm trying to look for information. I'm trying to look for data. I'm trying to look for anything to put this talk together. There is nothing. There is nothing there. So I thought, you know, I'm going to do something about this. I, uh, I started doing research, 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 got together, sort of a talk. I didn't really know what I was talking about. Why did I do this talk? The room was packed. Guys, they were sitting on the floor. They were all over the place. And I'm like, clearly this is a thing, right? Everybody wanted to hear it. So I gave the talk, and I was talking about constipation as one of the things that happened with it. And we got to the end, and I said, y'all have any questions? And this guy raised his hand. I can still see this kid sitting in this chair. And he said, is it true what you said about constipation? And I was like, oh, yeah. And that would be true even if you weren't misusing the drug. That's one of the, one of the symptoms that happens. So if you're taking it the way the doctor gave it to you, you may still experience that. But yes, that's true. And if you're abusing it, of course, it's worse. And it was so funny because he looked like this, and he looked like this, and he looked like that. And I thought, there's the answer to a question that you've been looking for for a while, my friend. What is going on with me? And he would had that answer. I still remember that was 20 years ago long before any of this had happened. So that is a big sign. If you're working with kids, if you're working with people and they're reporting that kind of thing and you have some suspicions, mm, you may have just dotted your I's and crossed your T's on there if you think maybe substance misuse. The eyes, the very constricted pupils, I've had them come into the office and I'm like, what's up with that? And they're like, I can't even look at you because I've worked with these people in the jail. And I'm like, okay. And then you get this happening. I'm like, okay, you need a chair before you go out because they're just that high coming into the office. Um, I said, did you drive here? And they're like, no, somebody brought me. Because I'm like, you're not leaving here like that. We have had incidents here where people have had accidents going on the nod. That's what they call it, going out. Um, so that's another thing that happens. But the other, one other thing I want to say about this slide before I move on. The euphoria is the part that's the bad part of all of this, the opening one that I haven't talked about. They suggest that almost a third of us have the genetic predisposition to be addicted to opiates. You can be, you know, environmentally could move that way too, but genetically predisposed almost a third. And there are tests that can tell you if you're genetically predisposed. They use them mostly in pain clinics. They're expensive. But that euphoria that people get they describe that euphoria, euphoria as better than anything that they have ever experienced. Better than sex, you name it, better than anything. It's up there. And when I talk and I teach this class in the jail, not these slides, but when we talk about opiates, and I probably work with a thousand people in the jail who are, who are addicted to opiates, um, they all nod. They're, it's like, yes, yes, it is that instantaneous, I'm in love, there is nothing better. That's really hard to understand if that's not your reaction if somebody gave you an opiate. When they give me an opiate, my reaction is to run and throw up in the toilet. They make me deathly ill. So I have a hard time wrapping my head around how you would give up everything in the world for that pill. But this is, and they report it consistently. The next thing they report as this changes your brain permanently, the opiates change the way our brains function, and that you become so seeking of that drug is they report that nothing matters more. And I still remember this kid, not, not Hood, I've never seen this kid back in the jail and I've not seen an obituary. Young kid, he was, a, um, he was a trustee in the jail and we were talking about addiction just in general. And I said, you know, it makes everything more important. You know, nothing matters, the drug takes over. And then the guy raised his hand and, he's, and I was talking about, he said, yeah, he said, it got to be more important 
And now that's a really judgy thing. I mean, when you just said this drug is more important than your kids, and he said this in a room full of people that he didn't necessarily know. And what happened was this, that nodding. He was brave enough to say out loud what the rest of them, the reality was that this drug mattered more than anything else, than their children. That's very shameful to admit. So it's very hard to go and get help when you're just saying, you know, here, this drug matters more than my kids. But that's the reality of that. All right, next slide. All right, so we're talking about kids, and this was a good lead-in, and I appreciate that, <laughs> how addictive these are. Now, kids' brains are still developing. The magic number, I don't know why, the magic number seems to be 15 for really being addicted. So if you start misusing a substance younger than 15, the chances you're going to get addicted to that are far, far more likely than if you can make it past 15 before you introduce it. I don't know the biology. I can't. I'm sorry. I just know that to be factual. So the younger that they're introduced to these pills, the more likely they will be to get addicted. But you can see from this chart that the likeliness of dependency starts at five days. So if you take your child to the dentist and they're going to pull their teeth and they're like, oh, here are 10 days of opiates. Have at it. Uh, first off, they don't need 10 days with opiates to have their teeth taken out. That's, that's one. But two, once you get past that other threshold, the chances that they're going to get addicted, particularly if they're younger, go up so high. And you can see from this chart that after a year, the percentage of the kids, once they cross certain threshold, that they'll still be on that pill. Look at that. It's 45%. And then the lower one on three years is what we're at, 25%, that they'll still be using those drugs. Now, I was at a very interesting conference, and, and Celeste did a great job because I asked her to send me this, but I have to be honest, I haven't gone through it red. I was just at the RX Summit in Atlanta, and they were reporting research down there that is tying cannabinoid use to opiate use, particularly if the kids are under age. And what they're saying between those two receptors is they seem to be kissing cousins. So that the cannabinoid use may make it more likely that if you have opiate use that you become addicted if you have activated the cannabinoids early on. And it, they said it could just be even one and done. You don't have to be a regular user. Like, I tried this once. Now, I haven't gone in and read all the research. There was a lot. Celeste pulled them up and sent me the articles from this talk so I could read them. I have to be honest, I haven't read them. But I was very interested in that because in Warren County, cannabinoid use is pretty, is pretty well accepted. There's a lot of use here. And I'm thinking that also may, if there's truth to what they're saying, that also may be a precursor to how we saw so much addiction happening here. Um, we have so many MAT, medication assisted treatment facilities in Warren County, and they keep bringing in new ones. Guys, these are for profits. They're not bringing places here if they can't make money. And I think we're up to six, and then a private provider as well, so we have seven. 40,000 people in the county, guys. That's basically one place for every 6,000 people. That's a lot. I mean, Winchester probably doesn't have double that, and between Frederick County and the population of Winchester, you're 130,000, somewhere in there. So four times what we have, and they don't have double what we have. So just be aware. And I, I will, I definitely want to dig more into that and look at those connections because that was so interesting to me, and I had never heard it before. Never heard it before. But now that they've legalized in states, they're doing more research than we were allowed to do before with marijuana. So they're getting some information we didn't have access to necessarily. Next Can I have one thing? Yes. Um, I just want to add one thing, and you guys might be able to confirm this, is that the other problem with the younger use of marijuana is that it exposes these kids to the criminal element that is selling the drugs and the traffickers. And so the kids are becoming used to saying, um, you know, oh, I know Scotty. Scotty's the one who, you know, sells me the weed. And Scotty's also going to be the same person that is supplying the pills. And so it gets them in the mindset of they know exactly where to go when they want to change um, from one drug to another. And they may not. Sometimes disagree, guys? Do you disagree? No, that's 100% correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, if you're trafficking one, you're trafficking, you're trafficking more, for sure. This... Okay, so in April of 2022, I went to the same conference I just went to this year. And the DEA was there. They had just come out, finished research on these press pills. 
and they said four in 10 were potentially lethal doses. Four in 10, that was April of 2022. In December of 2022, the DEA revised their slide because they now in their testing had gone from four in 10 to six in 10. Again, going back to what I'm telling you about the potentially deadly. Maybe not if you have tolerance built up. Maybe so if you've never used a pill before in your life and people are like, oh, these pills are good. One of the things about the pills, and if they're making them their own, they mix them in bullet blenders and put in the filler and they sort of sprinkle the fentanyl over the top for good effect and uh, whatever else they're dumping in the pill and then hit the old button, throw them in the pill press, there is no recipe there. You could get a pill with absolutely nothing in it or you could get a pill with tons of fentanyl in it. There's no uh, quality control. Nothing is happening in these pill presses. They're pressing them out, sending them out on the street. So you watch your friends take two pills and you're at a party and they're fine. So you're like, oh, that's fine. They're fine. All's well. I'm good. I'll take a pill. And remember, your brain is not fully developed until you're 25. So that judgment, that, that thought thinking process, not fully in place. So to go, well, you should have, you mean, we told you it's bad for you, you know? And when I do these talks with kids, I usually open with, raise your hand if you think teenagers can die. Every kid in the room will raise their hand. They all look around. And I said, here's the thing, guys, and it's not your fault, but your brain isn't fully developed enough for you to think that that's going to be me. That's not how your brain works. So every one of you think teenagers can die, but you believe it won't be you. Teenagers die, guys. Somebody's got to be me. Somebody will be me. And just to get that point home, and six in ten, and those are, I mean, if you're betting, those aren't bad betting odds. If you're betting, you might take that bet. I try to emphasize that point. The next part of that point that's important, and if you have kids at home or grandkids or you're emphasizing this, 911 if somebody's out. You will get ungrounded. Your friend's not going to get undead. Because I hear it all the time, well, I'm going to get jammed up. We have, we have the Good Samaritan Law in Virginia where you won't get jammed up. Please, please, please make sure if you have kids, you're emphasizing, call the police. Even if it's not bad, call the police. You know, if that's not even why they're out, maybe they're just drunk. Leaving them there and hoping that works out, man, you can't undo it if it doesn't. Go ahead. All right, so this slide, this was the record number of fentanyl pills in 2022. And then you can see the poundage. So two milligrams is a fatal dose. That's 10, that's five and five tons and a little bit. So we had more deadly doses, 379 million doses of fentanyl seized in this country. We're like, what, 310 million, 312 million now? The population of the United States has dropped some. So more than enough doses seized to kill every man, woman, and child in the United States in one year. In one year. And if that's what they're getting, think how much there is that they're not getting. I mean, the volume is insane. Anyone want to take a guess what DEA or CBP at the borders say they actually catch? What, what percentage? Per what percent? I'll guess two. Yeah. Those publicly say about five and then privately I would guess so. too. Yeah, that would be my guess. I didn't know that, I'm just guessing. But nope, I'm, right, I'm just thinking it. in my mind how much gets through, so how many drugs are. And the other thing that's important to say about this, they're like, oh, well, we'll figure it out, and law, law enforcement will get this and do this. Here's the thing, $1,500 on the street spent in fentanyl translates between a million and a million and a half on the street, if I convert it, like the powder form, if I convert that, I'm going from a $1,500 investment to at least a million dollars when I sell those bills. Folks, am I going out of business anytime soon? Heck no. There was way too much money. So when you're talking about attacking the money side, that's the only way. It's the only way if you can figure out how you stop the money from happening because people have, are struggling with addiction. The need is there. Demand brings supply. So we've got to figure out how do you interrupt the money. Next. All right. 
Test time. Didn't tell you you're going to have a test because you all run for the doors. All right. So these are your these are your perk thirties. I want you to raise your hand if you think A is real. Raise your hand if you think A is real. Oh come on, you got to vote. No, if you don't think A is real, that's fine. You don't have to vote. How many of you think B is real? How many of you think I want to run for the door because I don't have an idea and this is a bad this is a bad time? I see people like no, I don't like it. Okay. In this one, if you chose B, that one is, in fact, a real perk. Next slide. So these are Zannies. These They got these off the street in Oregon. So I'm going to ask the same question again, Zanny bars. If you think A is real, raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you, you guys, come on. got to play. I make the kids play. Y'all can play. Raise your hand if you think A is real. Raise your hand if you think B is real. Okay? Raise your hand again if I'm bullying you into doing something you don't want to do. <laughs> the answer to this question, they're both fake. So again, six in 10 chance that the pill you thought, oh, I got this, I figured out how to choose this, is okay, it's a real pill, not. I will tell you, given the numbers on that last slide, and we're talking 379 million C's, and that's 2%. I can't do that math in my head. But given that, the chances that the pills you are getting are actually coming from a pharmacy, I would say are this, if they're buying them off the internet. No. They are not real. They are pressed. And 6 and 10 of them are going to kill you. Getting that information out there, so, so important. Especially the kids with the peer pressure of, oh, my friends are doing it and they seem fine now. Okay. So this is just a little, they give a list in here of the ones that they're seeing most often on the streets. Um, Perk 30s, Zannies, um, Adderalls. Those would be the ones that I hear about when I'm in the jail the most. That's what people seem to be trafficking. That's what people seem to be using here locally. It doesn't mean that other pills couldn't be dangerous. Just because I named those three doesn't mean that something else couldn't be laced with something else. Here's, here's another part of this that's really interesting. So you think, oh, well, these are the press pills, and if I don't take press pills, all is well, and life is good. I showed you they, brought, they got 10,000 pounds of fentanyl in powder. Well, now they're putting fentanyl in everything. And so people who misuse meth and have absolutely no interest in the opiates at all, that's getting put in the meth. People are misusing cocaine. I had a client just very recently freely admitting to using cocaine. Freely admitting, not, in, not even trying to hide it. Gone into probation and said, I'm going to test positive for cocaine. Walked in the door and said, I'm going to test positive for cocaine. Sure enough, she did. She went back two weeks later to be tested, and she said again, I'm going to test positive for cocaine. Nope. She tested positive for cocaine, but she also lit it up for fentanyl. Fentanyl is a one-way ticket to jail. She said she started crying. The PO said, this could have killed you. And she started crying. She said, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to get fentanyl. But whoever she had been getting the cocaine from was not around, so she bought it from somebody else. And the next thing she knew, she was sitting in jail on the fentanyl side. The people that I work with who work on what I will call the upper side, you know, the meth, the cocaine, they are very, very interested in fentanyl test strips, which you can use to see if they're fentanyl in your drugs, because we're, they're like, we're not about that. We're, we don't want that. We're not interested in that. But it is very, very much mixed in the drugs stream right now. And they, they will say, if you've got these, can we get them? Because they're not trying to kill themselves. Um, and because they have no tolerance, what we talked about before, if it ends up in their cocaine, the chances that it's going to kill them versus somebody who's a regular opiate user are way higher. Same as people coming out of jail who go and they're like, go hit meth and it happens to be laced and they've never used it or they're coming out of treatment and their tolerance is down. You see the overdoses then. Next. Is it marijuana too? Some, not as much seeing it in the marijuana. It is some, and some people sprinkle it. I mean, I've had people flat tell me they'll sprinkle it in theirs, but I'm like, hmm. Um, it is, it is in marijuana some. Especially in the vaping cartridges, yeah. more than, you yeah. know, probably the leaf 
itself is in the yeah. vaping cartridges. We have we have somewhere in here. I do have statistics around like how many because I was looking for teenagers. How many teenagers they believe have died or overdosed on marijuana laced with fentanyl? Here's another one that is scary. Um, so that to me looks like candy. Mm -hmm. I look at that and think that looks like candy. It's what they call rainbow fentanyl. And very, very much targeting youth. The kids, the kids can tell you that. Like when I do this presentation for kids, I was like, how do you suppose this, they make the pills that color? The kids go, well, it looks like candy. I was like, yeah. So why does it, what, does, what difference does that make? Like, well, because kids like candy. I'm like, yeah, right there. So if you're seeing brightly colored pills, hmm, very good chance that there's fentanyl happening. Is there a difference between the colors, or is it just because they're colorful? Or is there a difference between each single color of them? Mm -mm. There's not a difference between oh. them. They're just colorful. They're just to bring kids in. It's sort of like when they had the vape cartridges and you'd have fruity pebbles and some of those things, and you're like, how many adults want fruity pebbles? The answer to the question is not many, but the kids are about it. So this is the same kind of idea. How do we get younger customers? Um, I actually like fruity pebbles for more. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just some of the charts that we were talking about, and we've sort of alluded to this before. This is as of 2020, but you can see again for the 18 to 45 year olds how far the fentanyl poisoning is outstripping everything else. Everything else. And it's been, gosh, I can't remember, 2016, 2015, somewhere in there where uh, drug overdoses overtook auto accidents as the number one killer of people. The, the numbers are staggering. Next. And so here's just another look at that, if people visualize it differently. But you can see car accidents sort of fairly stable, and we keep improving the safety of cars, right? They have the airbags, they, you know, they have the things that beep on the outside now in the new cars. If somebody's out and you're thinking of moving, it's beeping and going, ah, there's somebody there, you're going to hit them. We're trying to increase the safety of that. There are about 300 million cars in the United States. We had 379 million doses of fentanyl seized. More fentanyl than cars in the United States. It would make sense to you that more people might die from fentanyl, particularly because they're trying to make that stronger and stronger and more and more deadly, and we're trying to make our cars safer. We keep finding new ways to kill ourselves, new and improved ways to how do we kill ourselves and here's the answer to the question. Next. All right. So before I go, before I talk about this, I do want to talk, and I, and I, I actually had a conversation with Crystal about this, well, I don't know, whenever the youth leadership forum was, end of March. Because there's a new drug that they're tainting, um, they're tainting fentanyl with called xylazine. She said they hadn't seen much of it around here. Um, when I was at this conference again, it was a liquid form. So it's an anesthetic for large, like, equine, horses, cows, something like that. And um, they made it in liquid form and they would mix it in with fennel and it would, give, it would give a longer high and a more intense high, but it reminds me very much of a drug that we don't hear about much now called crocodile. So it makes your flesh rot. I did not put the slides in here. The presentation we were at was right after breakfast. And they're like, we should have warned you. I'm like, should have warned us. Oh my goodness, down to the bone. The bone's hanging out. The flesh is hanging off. These people, it is disgusting. And what, now what's happened is the company that was making xylazine for legal purposes, for the anesthetic, declared bankruptcy in February of 23. And now they're going to move away because they're not making the liquid that's coming in a powder form. Well, oh, guess how much easier that is to mix with that in the left. You've got it in powder. So they're going to have it in powder form, mixing it with that. And they were showing sort of a, um, I'll use the word transmission because I don't have a better word, of how it was moving through the country. Xylazine isn't new. They first were reporting it in Jersey, like 2018, somewhere in there, but how they were showing the movement of where they're seeing it. They expect it to spread across the country, and now in this powder form, more. And they're like, well, why? If my flesh was literally hanging off my bone, why would I keep doing that? And the answer to the question is, it's an anesthetic. So they keep giving it to themselves to rot, that rots the flesh because it takes the pain away from the fact that their flesh is rotting. Because to me, that's just crazy. If my arm would do that, but I was like, okay, that makes sense to me. I got, I got it. 
So let's talk about overdoses for a minute. So these are some signs of overdose. You don't necessarily have to have every sign to be, to be there. Um, the gurgling noises is one that I hear from people on <coughs> overdoses a lot. That one is, I mean, aside that they're not breathing, but gurgling seems to be a really um, often listed, you know, my friend was doing whatever they were making the gurgling noises, my friend was doing whatever they were making gurgling noises, I hear it frequently in the jail. So this is sort of what you're looking for. You cannot go wrong, next slide. You cannot go wrong, oh wait, sorry, I won't jump ahead. All right, let's talk about overdose for a minute. Oh my goodness. So, opiates reduce your body temperature. Okay, they reduce your body temperature. If you put somebody in a cold shower or an ice bath, or I'm telling you, they tell me that they will shove ice up people's rectums to try to get them back awake, uh, you are bringing on even more reduced body temperature, which could lead to hypothermia. So you might, instead of reviving this person, actually be what ends up killing this person by what you're trying to do. Also, if you put somebody sort of semi-conscious in a bath and they slip into full unconsciousness, they drown. So here are things that are not to do. And remember, obviously, I'm giving this for you know kids. Bad ideas. Oh, but they revived. I'm like, well, then they were going to revive all along. That's the answer to the question. It's not that you put them in ice that did that for you. I teach that one in the jail because they tell me, I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. All right, next slide. All right, so let's get to this. So hopefully all of us know, and I'm going to let you talk about the new one that I hadn't even heard of today. I know about naloxone, know about Narcan. Internasal spray. Sometimes you have to give many doses. The most I've heard is five. The most I've heard of is five doses of naloxone to bring somebody back. It took him a while to get him back, and when he came around, he was, um, he'd been hypoxic for a while and had lost his ability to speak. He could not talk. It did come back after a little while. This guy was a young guy. Fentanyl had gone out with it at work, but five doses to get him to get him back around, and there was you know some damage. I know other people who've got some ongoing damage from having been revived with the Narcan. Your brain needs oxygen, guys. So naloxone is the way to go with that. We do do. If you saw them on the table, we do do revive trainings two a month. They're free, and you do get naloxone with them. Just need to sign up on um, it's, it's on NW Prevention, right? They can sign up nwprevention.org, and they they can go through the training. It's a quick training, and then they'll get that mailed to them. Next slide. All right. So let's quickly how this works. So I told you you have opiate receptors. When you take an opioid, it goes in and it fills in those receptors in your brain and works all the way down your body. And if you get too much, you die. The naloxone goes in and it basically replaces the opiate in that receptor and holds that space. So it reverses the overdose. Now I'm sure people who have revived people will tell you that they're not exactly grateful when you bring them around. It was my best high, it was my highest high, and they woke me up. And then they're in immediate withdrawal and they're sick and they're not at all grateful. Um, but that's how it works. But if they have a longer acting opiate on board, they need to still be watched because the car fentanyl will last longer, if that's what's around, than a pill, and they'll go out again. That naloxone will hold about four hours. That will come back in and fill in those receptors, and you can see that person not have used a substance, but go out again and need to be revived again, depending on what they've taken. The xylazine is not reversible by this. So if it comes on and it shows up, and they have both, they've got a double overdose going on, they're not going to be able to bring them around. But Always, always, if you have Narcan, you're in doubt, even if they're having a heart attack, it will not hurt them. It does not hurt to give them Narcan. Always give them the Narcan. You're not going to kill them if you give it to them and you're wrong. Right, do you want to talk about? Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, the, there's a couple varieties of Narcan now. So Narcan is a brand. I think I'm the oldest person by a long stretch in this room. Um, but do you remember people who should say, oh, I need to make a Xerox copy of something? Xerox is the machine, right? It's not the copy. Um, Narcan is the brand of naloxone. There's a new one um, that I just someone gave me this week. Um, this is Zimhi, um, and anyone have heard of an EpiPen? You know, for kids, that have, mm -hmm. this is the equivalent. Um, you can also see back in the previous slide it said naloxone four milligrams. This is five milligrams, and also by injecting it, 
it works much faster. Um, so this is a pretty interesting um, new naloxone, and I can the company that gave me this will give away a lot of it. If, if you guys need it, you need it. Um, I want to definitely have people trained they'll on They'll be training on it. There's um, also this was um, you were in what part of West Virginia? I was in Jefferson County. So Huntington, West Virginia, oh, yeah. uh, another um, area of the country that's been hit really hard. Um, the a drug institute that there again people give me lots of stuff because this is. All I want to do with my life is work in this area. Um, this is to be a wall-mounted kit. Um, and it, it like, oh, I don't want Narcan. How many of you have Band-Aids at home, right? You're not intending to cut yourself. Um, and the library you know, probably has a first aid kit. Um, people aren't coming here to get cut, but things happen. But this is to be wall-mounted. It has protection in it. And then to remind you how to administer Naloxone. Oh, that's brilliant. Let's wow. take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, pretty neat. Check to see if somebody really is. What is the uh, cost for that versus, or do you know the cost versus the naloxone? Oh, this one? Yeah, um, I don't, I just don't know if you're, I can certainly, if you give me your card, I'll put you in touch with the right people. Um, but I can also just get some donated. Um, that we'd love to have it donated. <laughs> and the other part of that is it gets around our training thing. The law in Virginia that you have to have training before you can administer it, it's right there. I am looking yeah. at we could that gets right around that law. Well, that is brilliant. And it could be in Spanish, and there's also a training mode that's like longer. Let's take a deep breath. And it's training Definitely. the trainer um, on there too. It's a pretty it was oh. like, wow, this is a pretty simple thing. Yeah. Why didn't someone invent it before now? Um, that is absolutely brilliant. I would do a happy dance, but he's filming, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um so we also have medicines, just so people are aware. We are, if you aren't aware, I think the Methadone Clinic has opened now in Front Royal. Methadone is um, just a straight up opiate. Straight up, there's no blocker in it. Is regulated, generally people go to the Methadone Clinic first thing in the morning, get their dose. They go through their day, they go the next day, and if they've done it for long <laughs> enough, they'll usually send them home with about a week's, a week's supply they check on them. Buprenorphine, Suboxone, Subutex, that might be the name you heard from it. They're showing it in pill form. I often think of it as a strip that goes under your tongue, a sublingual strip. It has half a blocker, half an opiate. So this is for people who are actively misusing on the street. They don't want to go into withdrawal. So they need something to give them so they don't get sick, but block so that they can't get full on high. You can in the beginning. People do definitely report with Suboxone getting high. That should, as your body gets used to it, go down. But the, the docs are trying to guess how much you're taking on a daily basis on the street. They don't know the purity of what you're taking. There's a little science involved in that, so you will see that ball. And the last one, um, naltrexone, Vivitrol, they give a shot. You can take it in pills too, but the shot lasts 30 days. It is a complete blocker. So it's an, an, an agonist, blocks all the, your opiate receptors. It keeps you from getting high. Now, when you come right to the end of that, you're like, you're 25 days or something in there, maybe. But early in the middle, it's good protection. I know many people, we try to get people coming out of the jail on Vivitrol as soon as they hit the street. If they are willing, I have a doctor in town, I can get you there, I can get you in, let's get you this shot, let's protect you. Because they can go right on that, they're not gonna have withdrawal. And I was like, you won't have to think about it, it gets rid of your craving, you can go about your business, it lasts for 30 days, you don't have to show up every morning to get it, you don't have to do any of those things. We've had really, really good success getting people on the Vivitrol, and if they stay on the Vivitrol, we also manage to keep them out of jail and they go about their life. There is a pill form of that too, much cheaper. The shots are expensive. Pills are like 36 bucks for a month. That's about a thousand for a month. Insurance will cover that. Last 30 days. I generally don't recommend the pills unless you've been on it for a while. Because I was like, not that I don't trust you guys, but I don't trust you guys. So you need to have, be used to being well for a while before you switch this pill. Because if you don't take the pill, you can go out and get high. So that's, that's that. Next. All right. So in the end, for anyone, but again, thinking that this curriculum is for kids, no random pills ever, anywhere, doesn't matter. We are not taking pills. I don't care if it's your best friend who is giving you this pill. They're not trying to kill you, but they don't know any more what's in that drug than the man in the moon knows. The person who made the drug doesn't necessarily know what happens to be in your individual pill. Horrible idea. No medications for anyone else. This is even in your house. Those pills are made for the person who was given them based on their weight, based on every other thing that goes with the level of pain. And you should not take <coughs> other people's 
pills. That's some of how we got into this mess was they were in the house and like, oh, here, little Johnny, you can have one of my pills. It'll make your leg feel better, and I don't have to take you to the doctor. And then the next thing you know, little Johnny is addicted to opiates and in jail. Exactly as prescribed for the least amount of time. You saw five days, you start to get to that tipping point where you're more likely to be addicted. For the pain immediately when you don't need it, if you can go back down to 800 milligrams of Motrin or those things, you need to move to that. The other part about that that we try to stress to the kids is pain is important information. You have pain because something is wrong in your body. When you make it so you don't feel that pain anymore, you are not allowing your body to heal because you can push through it. I said to Celeste before I came, they were putting a new roof on my house and there was a roofing nail laying on my front step, this. Fortunately, I didn't step on it in my shoe. But what I said to her was, oh, well, the shoe would have gone on either way. I'd have pulled it out of my foot and I'd have gone down to speak. Mm -hmm. Pain is important information, as I stand here and tell you this. And I would have ignored that and gone about my business instead of resting. So it is important. We as a culture, quick fix, take that pill, you can get back to work, you can do all those things instead of saying, I matter and my body needs time to recuperate. I need to take a break. And that, that's a really important point to, to bring to anyone else. Now, that clock, according to my watch, is five minutes fast. Hooray! Okay. <laughs> so answer and I'm sure Mr. Carroll can answer for five minutes and then I sorry to be rude but I've got to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yes ma'am. Um, so you talk about methadone and all those things. Juveniles can't get those things. Is yes. that correct? In general no. So I'm the only juvenile probation officer in this town and I'm dealing with yes. a And you are and and you 100 percent and we unfortunately have lost kids um, who were trying to get into treatment, or underage, trying to get them in, and then they passed away two weeks short of their 18th birthday from an overdose, and we couldn't get them into treatment because they're not they're not treatment facilities for younger kids. It's very very difficult if you're treating juveniles, um, and I wish I wish that news were better, but that is unfortunately the sad truth of that. Yeah, I was on the phone just probably about two months ago with the Virginia Department of Health. Um, they wanted a briefing on some of the trafficking sites so they can figure out what's coming next. Um, and we started talking about the juveniles, and it's really tough. There, there are a few doctors in Virginia that will prescribe to juveniles, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty rough to find one. Because that brain isn't fully developed and they're not sure how that one's gonna work. And I mean, I understand from the liability side, if I were a doctor too, I might, I mean, that's, it's, it's a horrible place to be. Anyone else? Thoughts? Feelings? Yes? This is so packed full of information. I'd love to hear it again. Where do you do this, or how can we learn more? You can come tonight. I'm going to give it again. We'll have a floor show tonight. You'll have feathers. And Where? <laughs> We're going to do cabaret style tonight. Not today. That's evening wear. Where? Here. Oh, okay. We're doing it here again tonight. Yes? That's terrific. Uh, I live in Brown Town. I run a community mm -hmm. safety group there. Would you come down to Brown Town and get this? Get Surely. The fit? Mm -hmm. We can work that out. I would have, I'd be happy to do that. What time? Tonight, 6 30, yes. 6 30, yes. 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 Will you be here? Um, no, I'll be drinking my Rappahannock cellar, so why? Don't your life. He'll be thinking of us fondly while he's yeah. drinking his yeah. wine. Yeah. I'll be in his chair. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say you made a comment about the, I forget what the name of it was, the, the flesh eating thing. Oh, Xylon. Um, I live in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Oh. And um, Sheriff Harmon, who is the new sheriff in Martinsburg, we are actually dealing with that in Martinsburg right now. Yep. It's coming south. You guys I, might, you've seen it here probably. No. Beginning to see it? No, no crocodile. Um, <laughs> what, what you've seen up there in, in uh, Martinsburg is a uh, drug called Eulon. They call it street name Boop. It's utilized, it's a combination of methamphetamine with... We're uh, dealing with that too, but yeah, we're also dealing with what you said. With the crocodile? Yes. With a, with a xylazine, yeah. but yeah. they call it Trank. It's a, the codeine yeah. is, it's a codeine-based uh, medication, the, the crocodile. If, if Trank yeah. isn't here, it's coming. Yeah, right. well, if it's in Martinsburg, again, I was working in Jefferson County, and we had the issue there, and that was, I came here and I said, in two years we're gonna have a heroin issue, and in two years we did, because it moved down, coming from Martinsburg. So if you're seeing it, 
within two years. And they were showing the map. It was really interesting how they were showing the spread when I was at this conference. And I was like, ugh. There's no escaping it. it it's going to be, ugh. Well, 80, I mean, 81 is just the corridor. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Running all yeah. Of that. yeah. And so um, it's not huge in Martinsburg, but we've had seen. Yeah, because it was up north is where it was where they were shown on the maps. It was more like Jersey, New York, some of those areas, Ohio, and sinking south, and what they were showing us. And yeah. I thought, oh no. So, if I'm like, one of the most common forms we're seeing of fentanyl in the towns from Royal Warren County and throughout the valley, um, it, it's coming in a capsule form. It looks like a clear gel cap, like cap. you would see. Yeah, they call it caps. Um, it's a mixture of fentanyl. Xylazine, it could have. It has xylazine? You're seeing xylazine here? The flesh eating? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So our people, um, they'll travel from here to DC, here to Baltimore, bring oh, it yeah. back. They'll make daily trips sometimes uh, oh, yeah. because of the cost. They'll go over there, they'll buy a cat for uh, anywhere between uh, three and six dollars a cat. They come back here and they'll sell it between 20 and 25 dollars a cat. Um, a lot of times it's, it's even containing something called parafluorofentanyl, which is another offshoot. Basically, they tell you what it is. It's, I, called, I was calling the lab because I had this result and I wasn't sure what it was. Happened to speak with one of the guys who was actually a chemist. He explained to me, he said, if you have a, basically if you have a Volkswagen, you know, Volkswagen, it's still a Volkswagen, but if you put a trailer and a flag on it, that's the same thing. So basically what they're doing is they're adding uh, carbons or atoms to this to either enhance or de decrease the effects, which in this case is to increase. So it makes it much more powerful of a, of a, of a drug than just the regular fentanyl. So it's the parafluorofentanyl. Um, we're seeing different varieties of, you know, you have the carafentanyl, which is the elephant tranquilizer, you have the fentanyl, and you have, we are seeing a lot of xylazine in it. And of course, the cutting agents, we've seen um, the hydrochloroquine, which was the drug they used for malaria. And yep, the, the yep. Treat, we've seen that in it, uh, quinine mannitol. So, you know, we get a lot of the cutting agents that they put in there. You don't know what they're putting in there. You know, there might be, like you said, there might be some in it, but, you know. Might be none in it, because they don't, when they put the caps together, you don't know. Yeah, but I, I didn't think we were seeing xylazine here. That's very Yes, we are. We're seeing a lot of it. That's very um, Of course, it really intensifies that high and sure. elongates it, does not bad things. Yes, and I've got to run up the door. What about, what about the bait? Oh, and we're seeing all these shops opening in, in Front Royal. I, I don't know. It's... it's it doesn't seem like it's a good thing to me. Yeah. Um, I can tell you this because we do, we are paying for compliance checks in those shops. And I can tell you that they are busting for marijuana vapes in the shops right now. Now, of course, marijuana in stores is not legal for another 14 months. But they're finding that the vapes are here and they're, that they're busting for them in the stores. And they're selling to underage because we're doing, we're doing compliance checks for kids. Mm -hmm. The other problem is a lot of the vapes are being sent to the U.S. illegally, and they're coming from China. Again, China, we can't ignore what's really happening in China as being a source country. But they're sending the vapes from China. Not only do they have, you know, a variety of, you know, what the kids all say are seeking, there's all sorts of lead, there's all sorts of other poisonings, you know, that is in these vape cartridges that are being marketed as the fruity pebbles that... Yeah, that are bad. No, Chris doesn't like, I've got to run, and I'm going to let Mr. Carroll answer, but I did promise that I would announce, and these are on the tables, they're doing a summer support series at um, the Phoenix Project, and the dates are on here, so if you're interested, there's parenting, there's a relationship red flag, self-care, all those things, if you're in public service that we need to spend time doing that we're not good at. So please check that out. I appreciate you guys coming so much. If you have more questions, I know he'd be excited to answer you, but they're going to yell at me if I'm late for jail. So what did I do? With, I had a purse. Thank you. You can use the QR code for your phone and do them online, or I have paper copies. So take your pen. Um, the only thing I'll add to that is that you were talking about the, um, what do you think the price of the pill on the street here is? 20? So, so if you buy it from friends, it's 20. Yep. Um, but if they're selling it to, to make a little money, it'll go up to 25 to 30. Um, but the we're finding it's more expensive to buy the press pill. The press pill is more expensive than buying the, the cap, the scramble, which is why we see more of the capsule form than the press pill. So um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to work with a former DA administrator, so we still go to a lot of briefings on this. The wholesale price of a pill in the streets of Mexico, 10 cents. 
ten cents. So, so that's why there's an obscene yeah. amount of money yeah. that so, so they can make. Buy those for approximately uh, thirty to forty dollars for those bills. They'll go as much as twenty-five to forty. But um, you know, in certain cases, if there's uh, someone who's dealing is past the mid-level uh, range, they're buying them for seven dollars fifty cents and then selling them upwards. So seven seven fifty is the cheapest I've seen. Yes. And that, that's at a price point then where it is more available to kids, right? That can you can find, you know, like usually a teenager can find ten bucks, um, and you know, so that's one of the things that's really concerning is it's becoming more available to them. And we were talking about kids throwing stupid stuff, or maybe it was just me throwing stupid stuff um, as a teenager. And you're nodding your head. You remember me from juvenile probation. Um, <laughs> they, um, they thankfully I avoided that. Um, but you know, you remember when you were 16, you thought you were invincible, right? Uh, you thought you could speed around the corners, you, you know, could race to your friend's house, and who gets there first? Because you're never going to be in a car accident. Um, the same thing is with these drugs. They think that, okay, well, I will stop before it starts eating my flesh. With meth, you used to see a lot of meth in this area. You probably still see some meth um, occasionally here. And you've ever seen people, it really impacts their teeth. Um, they have a lot of dental problems. And um, they call it meth mouth, not a very attractive term. Um, and you're not in your head, you know what I'm saying? And you tell kid, you show kids, and I remember we actually briefed the president on it, we showed him pictures of meth mouth, and he was like, my God, why do kids do this? And you show them, it never happened to me, I'll never have a car accident, oh, I'll try meth, I will stop long before I ever get meth mouth. Um, so that's what we're dealing with with these kids. And so there's another organization I think will, if you all want, will donate services, law enforcement against drugs and violence to sort of train the trainer um, of teaching kids some of the methods that's actually age appropriate. Um, we'll try to get naloxone. Um, Zimhi donated um, here to the county and to the department. So we'll try to do whatever we can um, here in Virginia. I don't. I think we probably answered all the questions. I'm happy to stick around. Yeah, the meth mouth. It's funny that you say that because. Um, Math mouth is not fun. No, no. <laughs> so I was, I was in a course. I am part of the, uh, the committee here for the, the Warren County uh, Adult Drug Court that's going on, and we had to do some training for that before we went to the course. And one of the things I learned about the decay that occurs with meth, with people using meth, is the tooth rots from the inside out, whereas regular meth, like or normal decay, will start from the outside with the enamel and work its way in, whereas the meth will work from the inside out. And uh, one of the things about meth that I also learned that, I've, that I'd like to express to, to the people out here is that the amount of dopamine that's released in the brain is one of the harder drugs for people to come off of. It takes more time because um, if you look at the amount of dopamine that's released in cocaine, it's 400 units. Meth, there's a thousand units of dopamine per, per use. So it's two, two and a half, close to three times more, uh, more addictive than cocaine, and it also takes longer, it takes a, a full year for a brain who has, that has, that when they've used meth, to come back off of it before it's actually back to where it was before. So it actually alters the brain. None of these drugs are good for you, right? No, let's no, be honest. No, no. Yeah, we're seeing a trend towards uh, meth here as well because it's so cheap. And like you said, coming from the border, you know, coming from the border, flowing up, so the further south you go, the cheaper it's going to be. And it used, meth used to be made a, a lot, or exclusively in the U.S. Now it's so much cheaper to make it in Mexico because they can get the precursor drugs, precursor chemicals from China to make it in Mexico and come across the border. Um, one of the reasons that I think we're also seeing a huge rise in pills um, being seized is because the border is not secure. Uh, I'm, this is not politics. I'm just telling you the truth. The border is not secure. If there is the regular fentanyl powder, you can compact it, it's smaller, it's easier to hide. Um, but they don't make as much money off powder because it's then pressed into pills here. Um, now, with the ability to move it more readily across the border, they prefer making the pills in Mexico and then bringing the bigger volume of pills because they can make more money that way. Um, there's lots of things that they're doing. Uh, the, some of the Marijuana is becoming more legal in the U.S. Um, I, I don't think that's a good idea because it does start um, kids down the wrong path. Um, but it's the reality of what we're dealing with. The black market has not ended in the states where we've legalized it. I'm happy to talk to anyone about that, uh, but the black market still exists. 
so there's still pot coming across the US and the canines, the CBP and word canines are used to sniffing for any drug, including pot. Now, there's a lot of conversations, probably the best I can say, about no longer training dogs on sniffing pot. And it's not because we don't want to seize the pot, it's because the cartels know exactly what's happening. So they will send a car over loaded with pot to the gills. I mean, if you can smell, and um, I presume you guys have probably smelled pot in cars before. Um, and you, you could, a dog could smell it five cars, you know, in, back in the line. So they will send a car packed to the gills with pot, with marijuana, um, so that everyone goes there, all the attention's diverted, so they have to wave the next 10 cars through. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl's in the third car behind the pot car. Um, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, you know, when we talk about these cartels, they are sophisticated operations. These are not, you know, guys without technology, without data. They, honestly, they probably have better technology than we do. The, that much cash, there's no restrictions. They have drones. I've been at the border, we're watching drones um, flying over. They, um, it's pretty remarkable what they have. And so we have to, and this is why weapon of mass destruction sounds extreme, but it's the ability to sort of marshal all of the government, including the Department of Defense and the intel agency, CIA, um, to be able to go after this threat. So um, thank you all very much. I'll stick around for a question um, if anyone wants, but I'm going to go. Um, get my rapid hand acceleration and stop me on the way out. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you all. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you.